I'm Sam Roberts of The New York Times, and welcome to The New York Times Close-Up. On this program, we feature leading newsmakers and The New York Times journalists who cover them. This week, I'll talk with Jeffrey Scales, New York Times photo editor and co-curator of our annual Year in Pictures. But first, we continue our series on free speech at university campuses. Last week, we hosted New York Times commentator David French. This week, we're joined by the linguist and author John McWhorter, writing recently for the New York Times newsletter. He argues the protections now afforded black students on campus are in stark contrast to the lower standards that critics of Jewish students are being held to and neither approach to speech is preserving human dignity. Let me begin, John, by asking you, what does a linguist do all day? <laughs> well, if I'm being a linguist all day, then what I do is try to work out how languages other than English, and hopefully not much like English, work and how they came to be. I also like to try to teach myself languages, which is not what all linguists do, but I just have this bizarre fascination with the other codes that people use. I watch somebody speaking another language and I think, hmm, I want to be able to do that. So that's what the linguist does. John, you wrote recently in the Times that Jewish students on campus and black students on campus are pre being treated differently. There's a double standard. What did you mean by that? Well, what I meant by that is that we've been having this whole conversation about what constitutes free speech and the difference between there being a free speech provision and what gets and what gets prosecuted nevertheless and there's been a general idea that we might expect that jewish students will listen to clearly anti-semitic or at least very hostile against certain jewish people statements and that this is to be allowed because life is difficult and sharp dialogue is something that we should learn to understand. Now, some people would say no, but the idea has been that it's on the table that Jewish kids on campuses are supposed to listen to people saying from the river to the sea and understand that this is just rhetoric or that emotions are high. And all of that is well and good, but as a black person, I can't help thinking that I have spent my entire adult life, first as a student and now as a professor and an observer of these things, seeing that black students are expected to shoulder nothing whatsoever. There's a whole culture in universities that anytime someone says something racist or something that could be taken as racist, something that has an ugly flavor, then everybody must bend over and change it and talk about how the university clearly hasn't done enough work. The idea is that for a black student to encounter any kind of bigotry or even the hint of it is a horror. It's as if the cyanide has been put in the water main. And frankly, as far as I'm concerned, what that makes me feel is that black students are being thought of as extremely delicate. And I'm not saying the black students are behaving delicately because frankly, the culture encourages that. It's the people from on high who are treating black students as if they are these delicate flowers. And frankly, it's condescending, it's dehumanizing. And I think there should be a middle ground. On the one hand, Jewish students should not have to listen to From the River to the Sea with whole groups of students being allowed to walk around with their fists in there saying that for, for weeks at a time. But then on the other hand, that means that suppose somebody, you know, does color in a picture of Beethoven, like they, Beethoven on a poster, and there are silly rumors that Beethoven was black. Suppose some drunk kids color in his face and you know go giggling off into the night. That actually happened at Stanford in 1989. Should that be treated as if the campus is a racist place? Should we say that black students have been grievously injured by that prank? That's what happened at Stanford, and this was a very long time ago. This isn't new. I think that really we need a middle ground. Black students can stand up to a little bit of harshness, even if racism is concerned. I hate to sound old, but back in my day, that is what was expected in the 1980s. And Jewish students, on the other hand, should not have to tolerate this openly anti-Semitic, vocal, and sometimes even verging on physical abuse. So that was my feeling. Is it just black students, or is it women and gay students and all sorts of other so-called minorities uh, why blacks in particular? Well, I am emphasizing the black aspect of it because 
I think it does tend to be particularly extreme. And also, I'm trying to stay in my lane. But obviously, this applies to other groups as well. The idea that any kind of abuse of power relations, anything where essentially white men are being allowed too much sway or being allowed to be abusive white straight men, then we are to sound the alarm. And okay, that's great, but then why is it that suddenly Jewish students are supposed to just buck up under this kind of abuse? And of course, the idea is because they're white and often are affluent. But no, that, that won't do. We have, to, we have to humanize everybody. John, you also wrote a column in The Times recently about affirmative action uh, in light of the Supreme Court decision, saying you were a beneficiary of it uh, in the teaching profession, but you think it's time to end it. Why is that? I think that affirmative action in the 1960s and 70s was essentially about helping black people, a significant number of whom were poor, as in you could argue that in the 1960s, most black people were poor or close to it. The idea was to redress that. In that climate, to be black was essentially to be significantly disadvantaged, no matter how you sliced it, and even if you were affluent. There was open racism socially, and then even within society, what we today often call societal racism, was much more deeply ingrained, much harder to deny. It was, it was a different world. However, affirmative action worked, and it's at the point where it simply isn't true that blackness and disadvantage are essentially the same thing. And what I mean is significant disadvantage. The issue isn't whether it's there. How much does it matter compared to 1965 or even 1975 in terms of the trajectory of black lives? And so I think that there should be preferences, but it should be based on socioeconomics. It's a noble project. It started with redressing the effects of slavery and Jim Crow and even redlining. Now it's time to expand it so that seriously disadvantaged black people are evaluated under different standards because that is morally necessary, but that we extend that also to seriously disadvantaged whites as well. And of course, what somebody like me hears is, well, you benefited from it. Why aren't you pulling in the ladder? And I will openly say, as I said in that piece in the Times, even by the time I was coming up in the 80s, for very upper middle class, bougie me to be admitted under lowered standards was wrong. It was obsolete. And I got my first jobs. I'm openly saying this. I got my first jobs as a PhD hopelessly undercooked. And this wasn't just the ordinary imposter syndrome. I needed more work and I got positions that I was not remotely qualified for. And the only reason I got away with it is because I'm pretty good at talking a good game. And I brought myself up to speed over about 10 years, but I made a bit of a fool of myself within my first years of teaching. And there are people out there who would quietly agree. And it wasn't right. And I was, I was put in positions I didn't belong in because I'm a pretty color. It was obsolete. Somebody like me who grew up disadvantaged should have been assessed under different standards. And of course, if that person was a little bit incompetent in the beginning, you might say, well, we're giving this person an extra chance because of the disadvantages they had when they grew up. It shouldn't have applied to me. And I wasn't as politicized in my 20s. I wasn't thinking about these things. I can't undo the past. But yeah, it's a policy that I don't want applied, for example, to my own children. We're in a different time. You're against affirmative action, but you're for reparations, an issue that's coming to the fore in New York State. How do we explain that? You know, I'm not for reparations. I honestly believe, and I've said this for a long time, that reparations already happened. I think that all sorts of things, such as affirmative action, such as welfare being much easier to apply for and use starting in the late 1960s. That was a reparation. That was a way of helping people who didn't have to live destitutely after that. And all sorts of scholarships that we have, the Community Reinvestment Act of 1977. We don't hear very much about that, but that was aimed at the inner cities. I think there's been plenty of reparation, and to an extent, we don't think there was because it wasn't called that. If all of those things had been called reparations, if the Great Society had been called the Great Reparation, I think we'd be having a different discussion. And I think that it's gotten to the point that what ails Black America is too indirectly tied to the things that happened in the past for today, money to be given to, for example, 
me and that there are all sorts of things. So, so for example, my grandfather, my great grandfather suffered under Jim Crow. My great great grandfather was a slave. I don't want money that should have been given to him. That doesn't that doesn't work for me. He he's gone. It wasn't right, but he didn't get the money that he deserved or he didn't get the jobs that he deserved. But what I have said is that I am not somebody who enjoys standing athwart movements and saying no. I I am not conservative I am not a Republican, although many people seem to think I am. And there are a great many people who are really into this reparations idea. And after a point, I started to say, why am I going to sit and say again and again, don't give us money, don't give us money? I mean, would it be such a bad thing if people were given some extra money? But I do believe what sticks in my craw is that even if it happens, I think there is a kind of black person, they tilt educated, who will never be satisfied. I would like it if reparations happen. I would call it second reparations. If it happened again, then the idea was, okay, we've turned a corner. America has apologized. We've got our money. And now it's time to stop defining blackness as being in a state where a certain shoe has never dropped. It's time to let it go. And I'm afraid that wouldn't happen. People would just say reparations is just the beginning. People would say they better not think they can treat us like animals for 400 years and then just pay us off. And so I'm not sure what the reparations would be for if a certain kind of person would have a hard time allowing that they were significant. And I really do think that the educated view will be, don't think the reparations are that important, they're just a beginning. But how does it end? And I'm not sure that a lot of people really even want to think about that. So I have just said I'm not going to stand athwart. If it really seems to be gaining momentum, I'm not going to yell that this shouldn't happen because who's, who's it going to hurt? But I really do hope that they can be allowed to be significant if they happen. Let me ask you a quick last question about language. We have enough trouble talking to each other, understanding each other, listening to each other. What is the impact of the Internet on that when we're using email, when we're using Twitter, when we're sort of losing all nuance in what we're trying to say? You know, coming to a certain age makes it clear what's different now from before. I think back to the 90s. And if I was going to get het up about something, reinforced in my bias about something, it probably happened at a party. It happened at some social gathering. You talked about what a good party it was because the conversation had been sharp and hot. It happened then. Then you went home. And when you went home, there were these print magazines and newspapers, and you watched a little TV, but all of those things didn't whip you up the way the internet does. The internet basically has human beings essentially live in your face all the time. And the result is that people end up siloed in a way that was harder to happen before. And I think we tend to idealize how nonpartisan the past was. I mean, think about the 70s. I was too young to really experience it, but how people felt during Watergate, how people felt about the Vietnam War. But still, there's something worse now because you can basically have somebody yelling what you think at you and around you all the time. And it impedes understanding across the divide. You never get to calm down. Thank you, John McWhorter of the New York Times. Thank you so much for joining us. Coming up next, the New York Times Year in Pictures. The deluge of news in 2023 was almost beyond comprehension. One way to see it more clearly is with the New York Times' annual Year in Pictures feature, the section in Sunday's Times that came out online this week Here to discuss some images that were featured is photographer and collection co-curator Jeffrey Scales. Jeffrey, you went through something like 10,000 pictures, you said. How did you pick the ones that made it in this feature? What distinguished these photos? Well, uh, just to note, it was probably more than that overall, much more than that. Uh, But we go through all the pictures the New York Times publishes uh, per year, and... It, that's approximately 10,000 a month. So A month? Whoa. So, you know, we went through, you know, 110,000 because we were finished by the end of November. But uh, we look for pictures that are compelling, 
that are news, have news value, that have a contemporary photographic vision, which is very important to the, the product that the New York Times produces. And since the New York Times probably produces more photography and devotes more resources to global news photography than any other organization, uh, there's a lot of pictures to go through and they have some fantastic photographers working on staff and freelance. Now that's something we wouldn't have been able to say 10 or 20 years ago, is it? That's correct. And there's been a lot of investment and uh, the leadership in the photo department, Megan LaRoom, who's the director of photography, has a fantastic commitment to contemporary work. And part of that is the benefit of uh, being able to produce uh, the news online as well, which gives us all sorts of other opportunities. Let's start by taking a look at some of the photos that uh, you selected. Uh, we there we go. Yeah, that's uh, the cover of the print edition. Uh, along with my co-editor, Tanner Curtis, we thought this was a very compelling image by Samara Elouf, a, uh, a Palestinian mother of four who was living in Gaza at the time. And it's a woman looking for her relatives, her brothers and her sister. And in fact, one of these is her sister who was pregnant that was worried about her delivery. And then the woman said, well, now she doesn't have to worry about that. And it's just a powerfully tragic photograph of Gaza. We run a picture like that. Do you get blowback saying that's pro-Palestinian? Where's the picture of the Israelis who were massacred? Well, as you know, we get blowback for almost everything we do at the Times. Uh, but we tried to keep a balance of both of those situations. I mean, there are many more pictures from Gaza because the devastation is so massive and the events in Israel were essentially one day. And it was a, a surprise event. Mm -hmm. But we do try to have a, a balance because, you know, it was a horrible, a horrible day there. And, you know, it's a been a horrible couple of months in Gaza as well. Let's take a look at uh, some more pictures. This is from Israel. This is a, a family and friends of two hostages that were taken anxiously looking for news about, about their the brother and sister. It's the Regev family. And the, you can see on the table there the photos of the, of the hostages. It was by a photographer, Tamir Khalifa, who is born in Israel, but is an American citizen, but he happened to be in Israel uh, that day. And this is probably after, you know, it's a few days after, because, you know, they knew their, their family members were hostages. Mm -hmm. Next, can we see? That's Joe Biden by our staff photographer, Doug Mills. And that's in Poland on the anniversary of the Ukraine uh, invasion. And uh, Joe Biden, as a subject, is not as charismatic as a photographic subject as either Trump or Obama. So it's a little bit of a challenge to get dramatic pictures of him. And Doug has worked really hard on that. And he described it like photographing at the White House and the president. It's like a matter of inches where he moves his camera. Because with this picture, he just moved it up like an inch and found that silhouette reflected in the bulletproof glass. Mm -hmm. But he, you know, that's what he says. It's a matter of inches when you're photographing. To get any kind of gesticulation or animation. Or a dramatic and interesting composition, because those moments are often very regulated. Mm -hmm. Next, please. Um, this is in Africa by Hannah Reyes Morales, and it was for a story about the growth in the youth population of Africa. and. It's just a delightful picture of, of young people having fun and it's, you know, composed really fantastically. Um, my co-editor Tanner and I really, you know, enjoyed looking at this. And that's one of the things that we, I won't say struggle with, but we're very conscious about is so much of the powerful news photographs are very grim events. Mm -hmm. So we try to have a, a balance or points of relief in, in the collection that, uh, you know. Jeffrey, does a photographer taking a picture like that and a photo editor see the picture in the same way? Uh, not necessarily. Um, you know, that's like a question. It's like, which is the photographer's favorite picture? Mm -hmm. Which is the editor's favorite picture? Um, 
often not. You know, sometimes you'll, as an editor, you'll get a picture. Oh, I love this picture. And as an editor, you go, yeah, but this one's better. Mm -hmm. You know. And what about things like cropping and enhancement and things like that? Uh, how does that affect what the photographer sees versus what the reader or viewer sees? Well, cropping and, and enhancement are two distinct things. Uh, most photographers, professional photographers, are trained to crop in the camera. Mm -hmm. Like you try to use the whole frame and crop in the camera. But news and live events, you know, they're not just waiting for you to get it perfect. So oftentimes there's a little cropping here and there on the edges, you know, or rotating. Enhancement is not something that that's really allowed other than the basic things you could do in the in the dark room, mm -hmm. you know, with analog film, like, you know, the color balance a little bit, maybe a little bit of burning and dodging. Not brushing someone out of the picture. No, that's... Uh, that's only on May Day. That's, that's, that's how you lose your job. All right. <laughs> Let's look at the next picture. Uh, this is on... That's the, stunning. This is on the border, and uh, it's by uh, the photographer Ivan Pierre Aguirre, and he spent, like, all day photographing, and then he just wasn't feeling he was getting what he wanted, and then... Uh, Which border is that? Oh, I'm sorry, the Mexico-Texas border. In fact, it's, it's in... El Paso. He's in El Paso, I believe, photographing a, a, across the border. Uh, but it's a, you know, an aerial shot with a, with a drone. But when he saw that picture, he said, that was really what I was trying to capture. Mm -hmm. And it's just a beautiful, the way the light is falling and the kind of the dust is picked up, you know, it's really, and this is, this is right before Title 42 was uh, ended, you know, and that was that big moment. Next, please. Uh, this is at a cotillion ball in Detroit by Miranda Barnes. And uh, uh, it's the Society of Detroit Education's Foundation annual ball. And Miranda Barnes photographed this event, which is another one of those pictures of life that is captured really well and life that is not tragic or, or, or you know, dramatic. but. Uh, I mean, it is dramatic, but not, you know, awful. <laughs> Why is, is that a better picture in black and white than it would be in color? Uh, that was the photographer's choice. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what it looks like in color. And there's a lot of photographers shooting black and white. It's, you know, a valid artistic expressive mode for certain things. Generally in the times, they, these are used in feature sort of pieces or an opinion it'll use more black and white let's look at one more uh, this is from David Guttenfelder in Ukraine and uh, the soldiers resting after you know a battle in this wrecked building and one of the things he said about this picture is like it looks quiet and peaceful but he said the noise going on because there were explosions and helicopters at that very moment and it's just captured really, really quite nicely. Speaking of noise going on, we have run more pictures than ever before in the New York Times, color now more than ever before. What is the competition between still pictures and now online, of course, the use of video? Uh, video is popular. I mean, I don't know that it's a competition, but I think some readers like video and some readers like stills. Stills have a unique quality of sort of freezing a moment in time and where you can kind of engross yourself in that that very moment um, and and they have a a unique relationship to history where you go back and even in the course of like a year you know we go back and see that moment in time captured by that artist or in these cases photojournalist mm -hmm. um, and their unique spin on what was in front of them. Right. And presented in a very truthful way because it's photojournalism and, and just they try to make beautiful pictures. The video just goes by you. Jeffrey Scales of the New York Times, the year in pictures in the Sunday Times and of course at nytimes.com. And coming up next, I'll have some thoughts on 
looking for good news. There's good news tonight. That's how Gabriel Heater used to begin his radio news broadcasts. We could use some good news now, now more than ever. When you stop to think about it, of course, we've got plenty to be thankful for. We take a lot for granted. But as a journalist, I admit I was stumped the past few weeks searching for some nuggets of positive reporting. The pickings were so slim that I wound up resorting to a recent report by the New York City Independent Budget Office. Beyond the mind-numbing numbers, some upbeat themes emerged. That's good news for all New Yorkers, and especially for Mayor Adams. Right now, he's hovering near rock bottom in the polls. But he isn't the first incumbent mayor to look unelectable, nearly two years before seeking a second term. Among the budget office's findings, the local economy continues to rebound from the COVID pandemic. Employment is about to match pre-pandemic levels. The outlook for growth in personal income looks strong. Despite office vacancies, revenue from property taxes will be higher than city officials estimate. The cost of caring for asylum seekers and other migrants will be considerably lower. The city projects a budget gap next year of more than $7 billion. The IBO says it will be less than $2 billion. Plenty of variables looming and entirely unforeseen things can alter that outlook. But let's hold on to these positive projections for now. Good news is hard to come by. For The New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts, and happy holidays.